Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Exotic Astrology and we are back with the Bhagavad Gita playlist and we had discussed the first part of the 17th verse from the second chapter. Yes, we are still in the second chapter. Second chapter is very long. <laughs> it is very, very, very long. 50, 60, wow. So many verses in the second chapter. 71. Wow. How many verses are there in the second chapter? We have seven, 72 verses. So, I think 2020 is set for the second chapter. Alright, so in that we discussed about how to go beyond bodily pleasures and the individuality of the soul was stressed in that by Krishna and the last paragraph that the last two paragraphs I shall read. The Hatha Yoga system is meant for controlling the five kinds of air circulating the pure soul. By different kind of sitting postures. Not for any material profit but for liberation of the minor soul from the entanglement of the material atmosphere. So the constitution of the atomic soul is admitted in all Vedic literatures. And it is also actually felt in the practical experience of any sane man. Only the insane man can think of this atomic soul as pervading Vishnu Tattva. So the important thing here which we discussed was that the five kinds of air, Pran, Apan, Vyan, Samana and Udan, that when we do certain uh, yogic, yogic uh, asanas and pranayamas, then these five airs in the body are balanced properly. And then we, we get a great, greater opportunity to connect to God. And finally, this culminates in meditating on the four-handed Vishnu form, which is there in everybody's heart. Alright, so now let us discuss the remaining two paragraphs of this purport, which is also very long. Alright, so let us still discuss the shloka once again because it's important we read the shloka, right? Om Ajnan Timirandhasya Gyanan Jana Shala Kaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurube Namaha Alright, 17th verse, again we are reading it. Avinashi tu tad vidhi yena sarvam idam tatam. Vinasham avyayasyascha na kaschit kartum arhati. Avyayasyascha na kaschit kartum arhati. The, transla the translation was that which pervades the entire body you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. So now let's read the remaining part of, part of the purport. The influence of the atomic soul can be spread all over a particular body. According to the Mundaka Upanishad, this atomic soul is situated in the heart of every living entity. Yes. Which Upanishad says this? Mundaka Upanishad. There are 108 Upanishads and Mundaka Upanishad is one of the very famous Upanishads. So that Upanishad says that the soul is situated in the heart of every living entity. Yes, in the region of the heart. Even the Paramatma is there. And because the measurement of the atomic soul is beyond the power of appreciation of the material scientists, some of them assert foolishly that there is no soul. So many times people think that, the, that we are simply a product of material elements. Yes, we are the eyes, the nose, the stomach, the pancreas, the liver, the lungs, and that's all. That's who we are. But whenever somebody dies, we cry if we are if we, we were attached to that person, we if we love that person. But then the problem is why do we cry? Because the body is still there, the lungs are still there, the heart is there, the teeth, the teeth are there, then everything is there. Well, why to cry when somebody dies? Just we can embrace the dead body. But no, we understand that there is something which is gone, which has gone, which will never come back. What is that? That is 
that soul, that spirit soul, when the soul leaves, that's it. The body becomes useless. It is just like a home which is not uh, inhabited by anybody. So the whole, the whole house becomes... There are moths and there are spider cobwebs and there's dirty things all around and we can't stay in that house unless we clean it. So therefore the body also becomes very dirty once the soul goes. The body is anyways very dirty but uh, in fact when the body dies uh, people don't even love to touch that dead body. You know, even if they touch they go and wash their hands. Why? Because now they know that this body will not be functioning and this is going to decay. The individual's atomic soul is definitely there in the heart along with the super soul and thus all the energies of bodily movement are emanating from this part of the body. So this part of the body is the most important part. The, the corpus cells which carry the oxygen from the lungs, gather energy from the soul. When the soul passes away from this position, the activity of the body generating fusion ceases. That means it stops completely when the soul leaves. Medical science attempts the importance of red corpuscles. But it cannot ascertain that the source of the energy is the soul. So ultimately all the energy that we have in the body is coming from the soul at the end of the day. So if the soul is there, everything is there. If the soul is not there, nothing is there. <laughs> Medical science, however, does admit that the heart is the seat of all energies of the body. But where does the heart get the energy from? Yes, that is from the soul. Such atomic particles of the spirit whole are compared to the sunshine molecules. In the sunshine, there are innumerable radiant molecules. Wow, very beautiful example. Similarly, the fragmental parts of the Supreme Lord are atomic sparks of the rays of the Supreme Lord called by the name Prabha or superior energy. So whether one follows Vedic knowledge or modern science, one cannot deny the existence of the spirit soul in the body. And the science of the soul is explicitly described in the Bhagavad Gita by the personality of Godhead himself. And there the purport ends. So, the thing here is, if you uh, read the Srimad Bhagavatam, there also you will find a similar statements where you will you find you will find it many places but you will find primarily when you read the uh, seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam where you will see the story of Prahlad Maharaj he's one of the twelve Mahajans of course so his his statements are very important and he's one of the most uh, frequently quoted characters in the Srimad Bhagavatam and he also, when his father, Hirana Kashyapu, the demon, who was killed by Lord Narsingha himself, when he uh, calls Prahlad that, Oh, my dear Prahlad, can you please come and tell me what did uh, your guru teach you? Shanda and Amarka, you know, they are sons of the uh, of Shukrachari, who is the guru of the demons, the Asuras. So, they had opened a university, you know. Shanda and Amarka Institute of Technology. <laughs> Shanda and Amarka Institute of Sciences. It was like a <laughs> it was like a super university where you were taught you know, politics, how to fight, how to kill others, how to torture others, you know, how to defeat others, then you know, how to be diplomatic, you know, how to be political and you know, Cut, cut through your opponents, then you know how to defend yourself. Uh, everything was taught except the knowledge of spirituality. And then Prahlad Maharaj, he he was a great soul, of course. He was a Paramahamsa, he was a pure, he was a pure devotee of Lord Vishnu, he was a perfected soul. And when he was in his mother's womb, then his mother had somehow got association of the great sage 
Naragmuni. And Naragmuni, out of his causeless mercy, had uh, enlightened Kayadhu, who, who is the mother of Prahlad Maharaj, in the divine knowledge of spiritual uh, elevation. And then Kayadhu had uh, Prahlad in her womb that time. And uh, just like Abhimanyu had heard from Arjun in the womb of Subhadra, similarly, uh, in Kayadhu's womb also, the great soul Prahlad Maharaj had heard from Naradmuni, and that is how he became a great soul, he became a Paramahamsa. And after that, what happened? The this small five-year-old boy, when he used to go to this Shanda Namarka Institute of Technology, he used to uh, he used to he used to talk to his demoniac friends that, my dear friends, uh, it is not good to think like this that we are demons and the devatas are our birth enemies, as they say, Janma Jat Chatru. Why should we think like that? They are also like our friends. You know, we should not try to defeat them, kill them and assert their position always. That is not right. We should be happy with what we have. And then we should not think there that Asuras are our friends and the Devatas are, are our enemies. No? There, we should not think like this in matters of friends and enemies. No? Everybody is a friend. Nobody is an enemy. The only enemy which is there is inside us, is the uncontrolled mind. And Prahlad Maharaj would enlighten all of his friends about about Lord Vishnu. And then he said that famous sloka, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Sukhmananam, that the nine processes of uh, spiritual elevation, he says. And then one the day, finally, uh, his father, Hirena Kashyapu, calls him and asks him, Oh, my dear son, my little son, what is the best thing that you have learned in the college? You know? your school, you know, what did your teachers teach you? Please tell me, please tell me, please tell me. And then Prahlad Maharaj says you know, that the goal of life is to serve Lord Vishnu and to <laughs> please him. And then Hiranyakashyap, he hears this and he loses his mind. And he calls Shanda and Amarka and says, what nonsense are you teaching him? This is what you are teaching him? And then Hiranyakashyap says, Oh, the enemy has taught things to my son. Who is the enemy? Lord Vishnu. He used to think that Lord Vishnu is his enemy because Lord Vishnu had uh, liberated Hiranyaksh, who was the brother of Hiranyakashyap, as Varahadev. And therefore, he used to consider that Vishnu is his prime enemy, his prime rival. And then uh, he sent him back to the school again, but all his efforts in vain. And then Prahlad Maharaj again came back and one day again he asked, Oh my dear son, what is the best thing that you have learned? <laughs> he again says that, you know, oh, I mean, he just repeats what he spoke the last time, you know, that we should give up our uh, addiction to materialistic pleasure and we should start practicing uh, spirituality very seriously. So that in this very life, we can uh, go back to the spiritual world and not return back to this material world. But this time, Hirana Kashyap completely loses his mind. And then he ends up asking him, Where do you get all these energies from? And then Prahlad Maharaj says, I get all the energies from the same place where you are getting your energies from. And that is Lord Vishnu himself. So that is what Prahlad Maharaj means. That is what he indicates that ultimately Krishna is uh, the source of all the power in this world. You know, physical power, mental power, emotional power, any sort of power, any sort of strength that we need or that we think we need or we think we lack is there in Krishna. And therefore, when we elevate our consciousness, when we uh, try to go beyond materialistic pleasure, then we become more and more connected to this divine energy source. And when we are more connected, then we realize that we are becoming more and more and more powerful. Now, does this mean that uh, everybody will develop biceps and you know, they will just go on breaking walls or stones? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that 
Now we will gain so much strength internally that nothing of this material world will be able to affect us internally. So even if somebody hurts us or they do some things which we do not like, which go against our nature, we will feel bad, but we will not be affected by that. Why? Because our source energy is intact. We are already deriving a lot of energy from that source. And when we do that, then nothing of this material world will be able to affect us. And that, and that is the reason uh, we, we will be at peace, we will be happy, we will be calm and we will, we will never get agitated. Even though we may get agitated, but we will not uh, take a derogatory step. No, uh, which we might regret later. We won't do that because we, we will have sense control. And to the degree we are connected to that source by doing spiritual practices, to that degree we will not be affected by the things of this material world and we will become very strong. And to the degree we are away from that, we either we are strong or we are weak. We are always helpless. You may think you are very strong. You don't need anybody, but Actually, you are just depending on your ego. And one day when your ego crumbles, then everything is finished. Nothing will be there with you. All right. So there are many people who are extremely proud and they think that, you know, they are very powerful or they are very good looking. They are very intelligent. They are very famous. They are very knowledgeable. And then they end up feeling that they don't need anybody. They can do anything, anywhere, anytime, whatever they wish. And they behave like animals sometimes. But then karma hits them back. <laughs> yes. The perfect example is of Duryodhan. Duryodhan, he tortured the Pandavas, including uh, Devi Kunti and Draupadi also, in so many ways which no human being can even understand. Even in Kali Yuga, you know, it's, uh, I mean, imagine even today, you know, um, a small boy giving poison to another small boy. Can you believe it? It's like even when we don't hear that today, that, oh, there is a five-year-old boy. He has given poison to another five-year-old boy. Never, ever I have heard, but it was there in the Mahabharata. Imagine the level of poison this Duryodhana had. As a small baby, you know, he had poisoned Hima. And luckily, by God's grace, Hima was saved. And that's what happened. Uh, he tried to poison him and kill him. Or weaken him at least. And then Bhima went and drank the celestial nectar of the Nagas. And then he became thousand times more strong, more powerful and more radiant. And then at the end, finally, he had successfully executed his vow of killing the hundred Kauravas. Including Duryodhan and Dushasan, the, the two of the most uh, the most devious characters of the Mahabharata, right? So these crooks were killed by Duryodhana, uh, so, sorry, I mean by Bhima and Arjuna and uh, Satyaki and uh, Yudhishthira Maharaj and by Bhima and uh, Nakul Sahadev, Dishtabhumna. So they had executed all the Kurus and the entire Kuru army was obliterated by the Pandavas, by the grace of Lord Krishna, of course, even though their strength was quite less. They, they had less Akshohinis compared to the Kurus. The, their army size was very less, but even then they were victorious at the end. Why? Because Lord Krishna was there on the side of the Pandavas. Until the time Krishna was there, there, there was there is no power in the entire universe or in all the other universes combined which can defeat the Pandavas. And this is what the great Bhishma Pitama, who was also fighting on the side of the Kurus against the Pandavas, that is what he says to Duryodhan on one day of the on one night of the Kurukshetra war, when Duryodhan is very much agitated and he goes and asks Bhishma Pitama then, Oh Grand Sire, why are we not able to defeat these just five little Pandavas when personalities like you and Drona and hundred of us, the Kauravas are there. And then Bhishma Pitama ends up telling him that till the time Krishna is there on their side, your victory is, I mean, your defeat is certain. <laughs> you, you will be defeated 
till the time Krishna is there and Krishna was always there with the Pandavas and that is why they were victorious at the end and Yudhishthir Maharaj was coronated as the emperor of the entire world. That is what is mentioned in the last shloka of the Bhagavad Gita also. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dhanudhalaha Very beautiful shloka that is. <laughs> You can read that sloka. There are different things mentioned by Sanjay, who is narrating the story, this story to not story, he's narrating it live actually to Dhritarashtra. You know? He says, wherever Krishna and Arjuna are there, Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna. The Yogeshwar Krishna, Yatra Partho Dhanurdhara. The archer, Arjuna, wherever these two are there, there are certain things which are present in that. So, what other things? Write it in the comments. Let me see how many of you know what is mentioned in the last shloka. Right? Thank you very much for your patience as usual. And if you are new to the channel, please subscribe to it. And if you want a consultation from me, you can always go down to the description section of my videos down below to find the link to my website. And yes, God is there with you all the time. Just look to Him and you will find Him. Thank you very much.